Hello, everybody, and welcome to this latest in the Values Jam guest session series. Alex, brilliant to have you here. So to kick off, please introduce yourself and tell everybody about the great work that you do. Yeah, my name's Alex Catello. I'm a uh, former teacher. I was a science teacher. I now work for Curriculum for Life. Uh, I'm a co-founder with the charity and we uh, and education lead. And we weave life skills learning through contemporary contexts. And we do so in an experiential universal inquiry. So we produce lessons that are fully resourced and have life skills centered through them. The way we produce the learning is through a process of co-creation. So we bring people together, we convene to co-create. So we bring organizations and experts and educators and young people from diverse backgrounds into a space and we explore a topic. And through the topic, we identify essential life skills. You know, what do young people need to know how to do? And once we've explored the essential life skills, the design team synthesize the learning from the different workshops. And then we develop the, the final workshop where we explore and scope the topics that need to be exemplified in that learning. The wow. design team then, then go away and we make the lessons fully resourced okay. to support teachers. And we produce a sort of facilitated lessons where there is a video guide and a lesson plan and then resources with supported dialogue for young people to go through a warm up, main activity and a reflection to determine their next steps. That's amazing. And I'm just sitting here thinking that sounds like a whole lot more interesting and valuable for everybody involved than the kind of traditional dump a load of knowledge on somebody and then get them to regurgitate it to give them a grade. Yeah, that's that's a fair assessment because the learning itself is designed to be experiential. So it, it, not just through the co-creation, but in the lessons. So it's the lived experiences of the people in the room, including teacher, that bring life to the lesson. And so tailor the universal sort of inquiry to their context and needs through the conversation. Wow. Well, because and you're quite early in your journey on this, aren't you? We are early in our journey. So we've produced uh, approximately 2% of what we hope to produce. <laughs> okay, what a great way to look at it. Yeah, uh, it's, it's a long journey. We have a very long view. So we don't view, because the learning that we produce has contemporary context and we recognize that those contexts will shift over time. Yeah. Then the, the learning and the process for us is never done. Yeah. So we don't we don't see an end point really. It's just an evolution. Well, I think you know we we're here to have our values gem, which we must get on to. But I'm fascinated by what you're you're touching on here because I think that this is one of the reasons why what you just touched on and what you're doing is so important is that knowledge is tr more transient today than it's ever been in history, and whereas. 50 years ago, you were able to acquire some knowledge and then have a career for 40 years based on that knowledge. Now, the, the knowledge today can be redundant tomorrow. So it's no longer the answer. And so I just love the, the way you describe what you're doing. Yeah, and we, we feel, I suppose, that the life skills are part of the answer as um, not, not the whole answer, but part of it, sort of understanding the skills, the values that underpin what we do and how we do it enables us to become uh, adaptive, uh, adaptable, flexible learners, really, that are, are lifelong learners as well. Um, so not viewing our education as a, as a destination, it's, mm -hmm. a, it's a continuous journey and that it's something that we're all on board with all of the time. Mm. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing which card we're going to get. So okay. I'm going to tip out the, the cards from the deck. Uh, how many piles would you like me to make in front of me, Alex? Um, we have four piles representing four co-creation workshops. Okay. And so those four are in front of me. So I've got uh, number one on my left-hand side and number four on my right-hand side. So which number shall I choose? Number four. Okay. So this is actually the smallest pile. 
And we've got eight cards, so a number between one and eight. Four. Okay. So the card you've drawn is well-being, which might have something to do with what curriculum for life is all about. <laughs> Underpinning. <laughs> so the There's first something thing, spooky about that. Yeah, there is. It often happens. Uh, and in fact, one... Um, the weirdest one I had was uh, I playing Valley's Jam like this. I drew the card and the lady said to me, um, have you just done something? Have you just done a trick or something? I said, what do you mean? And she said, well, last night when I was thinking about playing this game, I thought, I wonder if protection for the environment will come up. And that was the card I'd just shown her. And it's like, whoa, what is going on here? Yeah. <laughs> so the, well, alignment. the first question we have is this, Alex. What does well-being mean? And what does it look, feel and sound like? That's a big question. <laughs> um, and I think it would depend on the scales that you are thinking about well-being through. So we can look, and this is a bit curriculum for life-ish, if I'm honest, but we could look at well-being through the scales of I. What is well-being to me both physically and emotionally, psychologically? Yeah. What is well-being to us, as in how we relate to each other and the connection that we form between us all and the people we come into contact with? And what does well-being mean for the local place that I live in? So what does it mean for the community, the ecology, the species that live here that are more than human species? And then perhaps what does well-being look and feel like for the planet as a whole? So if I suppose I wanted to delve into sort of what it looks like, it looks like good health for people and place, good health for ecology thriving, uh, happy communities to include the ecological communities. Communities that can self-sustain, regenerate. And what does that feel like? It feels like a breath of oxygen, <laughs> breath, of air, breath of fresh air, a future that doesn't exist yet, but with great, I have great optimism that it certainly could with human ingenuity pointed in the right directions. Oh, what a lovely picture you just painted there. What about um, the, uh, what about sound? What uh, sound comes to mind when you think about well-being? You may have noticed I've got a bit of an ecological bias, but it would, it would be birdsong, rich birdsong. Okay. <laughs> It'd be bird songs beyond ravens and seagulls. Okay, so just in response to some of the things you've said, so the, the, the bits that I'm totally at one with you on are this, the vastness of the topic. You know, it's, it's just a, a tiny word, well-being, right? But you've already mapped out how big it is. And I think sometimes you know, we, we're kind of encouraged to follow where the attention is on well-being and that tends to be around physical and in recent years mental health and well-being I guess but when you do that you miss out all of the other stuff that you've touched on in terms of spiritual or emotional psychological and then from the I to the we to the planet and to other species and all of that um I loved what you said about uh, the thriving ecology and two words came to my mind when I was listening to you. One was harmony and the other was sustainability. So it's this, when there is that widespread well-being that you were talking about, there's this kind of, I suppose it's nature as it was intended to be. That that maybe is is the what comes to to my mind actually yeah i think it's connection meddling. absolutely it's connection sort of over over separation and um i think apart for me anyway our personal well-being or lack of is connected to the separation 
that we've put between us and the natural world, uh, our belief that we can we can dominate this natural world is fracturing because we're part of it. And I think it's damaged us inside to fracture the very thing that we rely on to thrive. And so our relational sort of breakdowns, as we may see, or our in internal sort of well-being is influenced and affected by this separation that we have from the place that that sort of nourishes us. That's a great point, isn't it? Because it does seem as though we think that the planet and its natural resources are, or the way that we behave, or some of us behave, seems to indicate that we think that it's just there and it's for us to use however we wish, instead of, like you say, thinking of ourselves as part of the whole with it, um, which is a very different way to look at it. It's definitely a shift. It's a shift towards thinking of ourselves as part of a regenerative solution rather than part of extraction. Um, yeah. You know, I think our way of extracting from, from Earth is also a reflection of how we extract from each other um, and how workplaces extract. You know, just phrases like human resources tells you how we view people. And we view them the same as we view the planet, you know, as something to be mined. Yeah. I had a conversation. This is probably a couple of years. It was actually before the pandemic. And I, I was talking to an accountant and I was talking about how when, we, when we're thinking about the planet, we don't actually factor cost in economically in the same way as you do in a business so for instance if you're running a factory you need the building right and you need to pay for the building but the way that you account for it is that you put a cost of running that building against your um, income for the business in order to understand how you're performing financially now we don't do that with the planet so why why not because it, if you think of um if you think of say a building with uh, a big flash air conditioning unit for instance you would maintain that you would look after it because you know that it's responsible for your building being able to operate at the the best standard and yet we flagrantly abuse our planet rather than look after it so seems crazy it does seem crazy and you know e even now the um and um, my, my colleague jennifer uh fransberg engelman can talk much more about this she, she's done quite a bit of work with deal um and some work on creating a regenerative economics curriculum and i'm i'm giving her a shout out because <laughs> her work is is really um extraordinary it's superb and that it, it comes really from exactly this place and this place being where the environment is viewed as an externality. It's not, it's not integrated as part of the system. It's like she doesn't exist in our entire economic thought. You know, it's the, the growth is not looking at ecological growth at all. It's when we talk about growth, we're just looking about endless ec economical growth on this finite planet. So let's, um, we've started off really big. Let's throw ourselves off balance and go really small now with the next question. So where have you noticed a lack of well-being? I could start. Uh, there's so many places to start. It, it's, again, it's that ecological lens that I I see everything through. Um, so I, I see a lack of of ecological well being, which in, affects my my personal well being when I walk past the astroturf lawns or the plastic hedges or the walls that we put up and provide no space for organisms to move that we marginalize them into these tiny pockets and then sort of feel quite affronted that they're even there 
Um, and so there's there's that piece sort of that's just literally walking out my front gate. And so that's that's a daily that that occurs for me every single day. But as a as a teacher, I can speak perhaps a little bit about the education system and how we are as teachers, perhaps through the lens of PSHG, well-being is present. It's there. And it's something that we require are required to to educate without necessarily having any training to educate and then through that there's also layered on top of this the fact that as a teacher you are worked in a way that doesn't align to a positive well-being and so it's very hard to educate values such as well-being when you yourself cannot walk them on a daily basis and so on a small on, on a smaller scale I think the way we work even in education, even as teachers, doesn't exemplify what we want to see in the world. We are not the change <laughs> at all uh, in, in teaching. And that's not necessarily a teacher's fault. It's not necessarily a school's fault, but it's a systemic issue. So we're back to the big picture. Yeah. And there's so many things in what you just said. I, I don't know where to start, actually. Let's start at the end there. So you're talking about teaching. Um, couple of things one very personal my eldest daughter is a teacher and uh, she went into that um, profession to change the world because she didn't believe that the system was the way that it should could be and then she got basically run down by the system um, and the way that she's dealt with that is Kind, she's kind of happy with it, but not happy with it in that the way she dealt with it was to just be a brilliant teacher and accept that she couldn't change the system. So that's what she now does. Um, and I kind of admire her for it, and I'm kind of sorry for her for it at the same time. And I don't quite know how to, to rationalise that because somebody does need to change it. It's broken. Um, but who, I don't know how it's gonna gonna happen. Um, you talked about um, no space in, in when we put buildings up. There's a an architect uh, now. What's he called? Mosesian. Uh, I can't remember his first name. Um, anyway, he uh, when he talks about his architecture, he talks about the buildings are designed for the space in between and around them. That's the way he views his architecture, which I, re I remember the first time he described that, and I thought, oh, that is so beautiful and so kind of out of the box because it's taking the focus completely away from the building to the space within which the building exists. And it's the space that it affects rather than the building itself that he considers to be the most important thing to consider. Um, and that that presents quite a paradigm shift in how we view the place we live in, actually, because that means we look at our, our buildings as, as in a way that asks how can we complement our surroundings rather than our surroundings fit in with our wishes. Yeah. And so how it, it totally changes really the purpose of the building yeah and it's and its place yeah so and it, it's a, a bit of a theme that's developing here for this conversation I think is this um constant move from the focus on small to the look at the big so and you know so that's come up a couple of times now and this this building example is the latest one where you know, we're naturally, not naturally, but we are perhaps conditioned to give our absolute focus to the building. And what that causes us to do is to forget the space around the building, which has just as much impact on people that are visiting the building as the building itself. Um, and then the the other thing that uh, when you were talking about uh, when we're at work and the way in which we work. So my original career was in commercial hospitality management. So hotels, conference centers, that sort of thing. And I worked for 
um, the Marriott company. And one of the, um, so Bill Marriott, who was the, the top guy, um, used to talk about how if you look after your employees, they will look after your guests and your guests will come back. And I had a conversation quite some time ago um, it, with somebody from the world of education about how that is definitely not the case in the world of education. And teachers, I think, need to feel loved uh, for them to do a brilliant job. And far from it, right? Yeah, I couldn't agree more with that. I mean, it when teaching feels like a transaction, there's something wrong with the way we view the job. Yeah. You know, it's not a transactional job. It needs a lot more heart, a lot more emotion. But it is it, it is and exists in the world um, as a reflection of, of what it's created originally to do. And by originally, it's really we create, you know, education. What was it for? It was for educating people en masse to function as members of, of a system. Um, and to to enable that mass education and we have to question we're forced to question whether that is really fit for future purpose um you know because a, a transactional education system you know you come in we set you up for competition we provide you with a ticket at the end to say that you've done a good job or or not actually is really what's going on at the very highest level in education it is a transaction and uh, what would what would education be like if it was not transactional? What would it be like if it was built around cooperation rather than competition? Um, and I'm not saying that competitive spirit doesn't have a place, but um, what would it what would it be like for for the young people and the teachers if the system was built on on a more well, ecological model, I suppose, a systemic model? Well, I, I don't, I don't want to kind of force this. Um... And I'm I'm feeling a bit guilty already before I've even said this, but could it be that the purpose of education is to enable well-being? Well, dare we say it? <laughs> to to enable us to live a good life. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I would argue that that's that's an education fit for future purpose to set young people up on a pathway where they love learning whatever that learning is um and that they love uh the world they live in they look out the window and they can love what they see they forge positive relationships and that the heart of an education system is about wellness for all and that that can also be highly academic you know it's not um it, it doesn't have to it doesn't mean that we have to lose academic rigor um, but you can still put heart into our education system. Yeah, and I, I, you, you're talking about um, the possibility of losing academic rigor. I think it's the it sounds like the opposite to me actually that it's academically a lot more stretching to be able to deal with well-being in the dimensions that we've discussed and the interrelationship between all of the various component parts, rather than this more simplistic transactional approach. Yeah, it's it's more of a systems view than a reductionist view of education and what is learned. And you know, if if we are enabling future generations to be able to understand the moving parts in our complex world, then educating that complexity um, from a young age is part of that is part of that deal. And it doesn't have to be complicated. You know, complexity uh, is not synonymous with complicated yeah. um, but infusing an understanding of systems and the moving parts within systems from a young age is totally feasible it's just we it's very difficult to do that when education is blocked into little silos that we assume that as the child moves from class to class they may or may not be making the connections between the subjects as they shift around the school and that's that seems a risky strategy to me. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, you've reminded me, I've, I've been talking to people about uh, the topic of kindness recently. <clears throat> and a, a thought occurred to me the other day, which, or it was a question, which was, um, is there anything in the world that creates greater value 
than kindness. And the reason I found myself asking that question was because of the science of kindness and how both the receiver and the giver in a, in a moment of kindness um, feel better, and that's scientifically uh, proven. And then the ripple effect of kindness. So, you know, it just continues to, to roll and roll, and you often don't know where it's rolled. Um, but it made me think, goodness me, if we, if we could measure the value that's created by kindness, I wonder how different a view of it we might have in the world. Um, so the, the reason that comes to mind is your point about complexity, because that is really complex to get into, um, and yet how valuable it could be. Yeah, and it's interesting, isn't it, that we have we we almost have to come back to um, giving it a value in order for it to be acceptable. And um, you know, we've been looking at that at curriculum for life. Actually, things like kindness. We've just done a a, a, a little topic on kindness and it was everything that you just described it was like what does it mean to be kind what does it feel like to be kind to each other and what is it can we make kindness ripple through our community and that's the, just the three three lessons and that got us thinking well what would it how could we measure the impact of lessons like that is there a way that we could qualitatively capture that because if we can demonstrate that then we can demonstrate tangible value yeah <laughs> and and it's almost like it, it's almost embarrassing to say that like, sh do do we have to give kindness a value but in some ways we have to meet the world where it's at um yeah. you know and it, it is this thing about being able to describe the impact so um on or in honor of world kindness day this month I had a values jam and uh, one of our guests uh, actually created a kindness movement when she was 98 years old. She's now 102 and she joined us on the call. It was amazing. But what she described in her town was how they got everybody finger knitting and they finger knitted a chain which went round this sports stadium and there were people of all ages, all backgrounds, all just joining in and feeling great about being part of this community kindness initiative. And we had the same, we would not, not in great depth, but we also touched on this. Well, how do you scale this, you know, and, and what is the, the, what is the benefit? How do you quantify it? Not necessarily in a quantitative way. It can be in a qualitative way. But you, you, like you said, in the world today, you, you need to be able to rationally explain why this thing is worth doing. Um, yeah, so that, that it, it just led me to think about, you know, the, the profound and positive impact that kindness can have and how the world would be a much better place if it was more prominent. Um, and, and also how, how it extends across the scales that we've talked about already you know kindness yeah. to myself kindness to each other kindness to our community kindness to our ecology you know what does it look like to be kind to that I'm looking outside because I've got this lovely view of the water and I'm thinking what would it be like if we were kind to that to that ocean if we we treated it like we would want to be treated ourselves that golden rule I think is what reboot the future call that um and yet I know many times a year uh, sewage is put into that river, you know, that, it, that into that waterway. And we don't treat it like we would treat our own backyard, but it's right there as, and we rely on it for our survival. And so being kind both to, uh, well, across the scales uh, is applicable. So here's a question then, Alex. Is, is kindness the key to well-being? Yeah, it's interesting. I've got so, so many of the life skills that we draw from with the Life Skills Collaborative. There's 52 of them. And when you when you say that, I, I note that the kindness isn't there as its own skill, actually. Okay. It, it, it doesn't feature, but it permeates. Yeah. It permeates multiple 
uh, life skills, you know, and not just the most obvious, such as empathy or compassion, but also or self-awareness, social awareness. It's kindnesses and all of those things. Um, but also creative thinking, team building, you know, leadership, entrepreneurship. You know, if kindness was at the heart of the motivations that underpin how we show up in the world, whether it's through work or ourselves, perhaps it would have a transformative effect on our well-being. Yeah, I, th I think the um, it, it occurs to me that kindness is often viewed in the context of being an act. Whereas I think in truth, kindness is a way of being. And the acts come from the way of being, because if it's just a, uh, an act, then it's not you're not you're not giving it the service it deserves. Uh, not living it, you know, it's not authentic, is it? It's just like it's almost like a tick list. I'm going to it, in in this competitive reductionist world, I'm now going to tick off that today I've been kind. exactly exactly <laughs> check, you know. And he, um, I was asked to do a short video about kindness, actually, um, just recently. And, you know, it's one of those, it's really weird. It's a bit like this conversation, actually, because, you know, we just drew the card well-being and all of a sudden you're going really deep and exploring things that I've not considered before, actually, in, in terms of the word. So I've been asked to send this video about kindness. And I was like, so what, what is it? And that's what made me think about the difference between the act and the way. And um, <laughs> this might sound a bit strange, but on the video, I said, um, think of having kindness antennae. And the first step is to be tuned in to everything around you, the people and the environment. And it's to collect the data that you're um, finding out with your antennae and storing it so that you can draw on it at an appropriate time in the future. Because the way that I like to be kind is, for instance, uh, I was on a call the other day and I said to the guy, um, I hope you enjoy your time with your grandmother this afternoon. And he said, what do you mean? How do you know that I'm going to see my grandmother this afternoon? And I said, well, I remember from a previous call, you said, Sunday afternoons, you went to see your grandmother. And he said, oh, yeah. And, and with, you know, it was a nice conversation. But I would not have been able to do that if I hadn't been able to tap into the data that my antennae had recognized in a previous conversation. So there's something a bit um, that that's this bit about the feeling rather than the focus on the act. And that's that those antenna enable you to pay attention. Uh, yes. Just the awareness of them, pay attention to what is being said genuinely you know it, rem it reminds me I was working in Hungary mm -hmm. and um, that busy teacher well-being piece comes into play here you bustle into the staff room grab a coffee on the way out and I, I would say to, to a colleague how are you and 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 sort of be walking out the door yeah and I remember one of my, my Hungarian colleagues uh, pulling me to one side and saying you know what in this country when we ask how someone is we actually wait around for the response <laughs> You know, and I thought that was it, it's such a small thing, but it's quite life changing in some ways when you think about that, that I now do not ask that question unless I'm prepared to collect the data. Good, good. <laughs> you know, you. and it reminds me in some ways of, of a piece of uh, a model that we were looking at putting into some of the learning, the ladder of inference. Have you have you come across the ladder of inference no. where um, you sort of look at the there's there's lots of data available. It just reminds me of your antennae and that um, you select the data that's available and think about it, sort of paraphrase it, process it and then decide sort of how to act on it. So you it's really the ladder of inference in my mind anyway, supports systems thinking, but also um, supports that awareness of your surroundings. So yeah. what data is coming into my field right now? Mm -hmm. And what does it mean? Uh, am I am I just going to sort of let it go in one ear or out the other? Or am I going to pay attention and inform my future actions? And I suppose that's about giving people time. And what you've described, I say in many ways, just makes me think of the Hungarian situation. It's giving giving a little slice of time to really check in. 
and that it's authentic. Yeah. Are you familiar with the term uh, saubona? Yes, but I'm trying to remember how and why. So it's a Zulu greeting. Yes, that's where I've come across it. I came across it, I think it was an organisation called Sawabona, and okay. I looked it up as to why is it called that. <laughs> that's why. Yeah, so the, the, um, the translation into English is we see you. And the reason uh, that it's plural is because they say when they meet another person, they look into their eyes, not only with their own eyes, but with the eyes of all of their ancestors as well. And it's just this really strong personal connection that they're talking about. And exactly like you gave the example, you said hungry, right? Yeah. Where they, so that it's the same principle rather than how are you as just part of what you say and move on and hope that nobody tells you the answer. Um, and that, so that um, there's a there's a connection here with what we were talking about, kindness and also maybe well-being in that perhaps there's these small behaviours and actions are far more significant and important than we tend to think they are. Yes, I I mean that's that that framing's quite interesting, isn't it? Because how can we know? I suppose it's a little bit like chaos, isn't it? How can we know the uh the outcome of our small actions, especially if they accumulate as kindness might as it ripples? Yeah. Um un hopefully in some ways unquantifiable. <laughs> yeah, what well, so Go on, say a bit more about that, hopefully uh, unquantifiable. Well, I think it comes down to, I, I mean, I've been spending quite a bit of time thinking about qualitative data and context. So when we quantify something, it's a little bit like sort of the issue of giving something a word, you know, la how language can reduce something that should be almost intangible. And as soon as we attach a word to it, it slips through our fingers and that the meaning's just gone. Um, and that's, I suppose, what I mean about that ripple effect. You know, what would happen if we reduced it to a value? Um, would we start accounting for it, I suppose? And, and then in, by accounting for it, perhaps we would then reduce it. And when we have greetings like, how are you? I, you got me thinking with Sao Bonner about Ubuntu, um, Ubuntu philosophy. Um, I am because we are, it's probably a very crude translation, um, is so different than I think therefore I am. <laughs> you know, these two things are so at odds with each other. And if we all embedded I am because we are philosophy into our world, you know, what would be the effect of that? And uh, would we ever want to try to account and quantify it? It's a brilliant question. And I, I find it a challenge to deal with questions like that because I, I, I find half of my brain is wanting to rationalize and understand the detail and the other half is saying just enjoy the beauty of it you don't need to understand it and those two kind of clash um, quite a bit and he, you've also reminded me of the work of David Bohm who I, I don't really understand a lot of what he talked about, but he was an astrophysicist um, in his early years and then started to uh, become interested in philosophy and community. And the way that his work was described to me that I understood was uh, look at the nighttime sky and most people comment on the stars. But what he says is the only reason you're able to see the stars is because of the black velvet sky behind the stars and you should see the whole. And he gives scientists a bit of a hard time because he says, you know, they spend their lives breaking everything down into the smallest component parts, but that's not the way things work. Things work as part of each other, um, which is what I think you're, you're just touching on there in terms of, uh, we coexist, and yet so much of the systems that we create, including societal systems, are focused on individualism rather than uh, collectives. 
Yes, I mean, uh, it rem- it reminds me of so many conversations I suppose I've had at, of late. And bear in mind, my my background's in science teaching, and I, I've educated sort of scientific methodology as a way of knowing. Um, I was fortunate enough to then be involved in theory of knowledge, which looks at multiple ways of knowing. And how do we know through the arts and um, how do we know through uh, history, for example? Um, And so I've been fortunate enough to have later on in my career that exposure to all subjects and to look at the methodologies of how they know. Um, But the more time I spend thinking in the systems space, the more time I'm brought back to a word that I would never use in the scientific space myself and that's the word sacred Um, and what what is sacred to me so I think of the natural world as something that's really a a sacred complex space and where we are in that natural world and then I have this conflict a little bit like perhaps you do with wanting to numeric put a numerical value on something but knowing that if you do that it may reduce it um so in in the one on the one hand i think about ecology and the complexity of our systems as something really beautiful really sacred really complex and on the other hand i view our reductionist sort of perspective our our scientific methodology as being so important for how we've understood the world in its pieces but yeah. how very dangerous that approach may have been for our planet as a whole. And what impact has reduced scientific thought had on how we extract and treat our world? And, you know, so science has a place. It's a little bit like the numerical values, the quantitative values. It has a place, but only in the bigger context. And for me, a quantitative value has a place, but only in the qualitative localized context of the people and the places they're in. That's a that's a brilliant way to look at things because we're, just before you, you wrapped up that bit, uh, what you were saying was making me think about how um, often we understand that we want to get to an end point in order to do that, we create the means to get there. But then we become all consumed with the means and we forget the end. So in business, for instance, uh, you put in an IT system in order to achieve something very worthy that you wanted to achieve. But then all of your resources get consumed with serving this IT system and you're not achieving the end that you wanted to in the first place anyway. And that it strikes me that that's an, an, a metaphor for what you've just described again. So it's us, it's us failing to, failing to keep to the original context and becoming distracted by the detail on the way. So the science, like you say, is a way to explain things, which is great, but then it becomes the thing that we're serving rather than the remembering why we did it in the first place. Yeah, it becomes cause and effect, doesn't it? And, yes. and the world is more complicated than that. And you could use your own body as a system. And what is it like when you go to the doctor? You know, what happens? Um, I've got a pain in my big toe. Okay, well, we'll treat the big toe. But what if the pain in my big toe is caused by a trapped nerve in my neck? Yeah. You know, <laughs> then treating the big toe is pointless. It's a, it's a symptom. It's not a root cause. And, you know, that the whole methodology is rooted in a reductionist approach, our inability to see as a system, which can then be traced back to where we started, which is in the education system itself. And what are we actually educating for? Mm -hmm. Now, I I feel that we're kind of uh, out of time, but we could continue this conversation for a long time. I'm going to draw the values jam to a close with a final question, Alex, which is what are you encouraged to do differently about well-being as a result of our conversation? My next steps. Ooh. 
I'm I'm flitting. The reason I'm pausing is because I'm flitting between the reductionist and the systemic. <laughs> and and so sort of, I feel like a sort of um a bird of prey, you know, going out and looking at the scene as a whole, then trying to narrow back in and think, right, what's next? So because our conversation's been so huge, I think I'd have to go with something really small um and i'll go with something really small uh, my husband is american so today is thanksgiving yeah um and i will go with something really small because we are giving thanks and we have a big table that i'm sitting at right now that's going to be filled with with food later um and friends and family coming around to join so i think i'm going to start with um a little bit of kindness and we're going to have this conversation around the dinner table uh, about kindness and its ripple effects. So I'm going to cultivate the scenario. And now I'm thinking about it. I'll think about how to bring it in to the dinner table to actually host a conversation about kindness, ripple effects and well-being and see where it goes, because we've got ages from 10 to 70 around the table tonight. Oh, well, that sounds like it will be fantastic. And I'd love to, to hear how it goes. Yeah. And it is a great fit because isn't that isn't kindness the core principle of thanksgiving it is yeah um i mean probably don't want to delve at this point too much into where it where it went to um but originally yes it was um if i or i call my husband's probably going to scowl at me in a moment but it was a celebration of the first harvest survival really and kindness through cooperation right okay and mine is you're going to need to help me with my uh, what I'm encouraged to do differently. You mentioned somebody's work. Was it Jennifer? Somebody. Jennifer Bran Bransberg Engelman. Bransberg. Bransberg. Engelman. I will connect you if you are interested. She's doing some great work. Well, yeah, I, you you were obviously really impressed with what she's done, and I'm, that makes me curious. So. Uh, I want to either look her up or an invitation would be wonderful. Yeah, she's. we've worked together for on and off for years, um, former economics um, business teacher, and um, she's done quite a bit of writing for educational uh, establishments. And then we worked together on a Teach the Future project to rewrite the national curriculum in economics as though the government were taking the climate crisis seriously. Um, and... and uh, which she worked on, but then she took it a step further and wrote a regenerative economics curriculum, a transformed curriculum, um, which she's now putting out into the world in the commons. Fantastic. So I will connect so, you. Thank you very much. And thank you for, my brain feels like it's been worked very hard, actually, over this last 50 minutes or so. But it, Me too. <laughs> it feels tired, but... Um, that feeling when you, you're tired, but you're feeling good at the same time, it, it feels like that. So thank you for the Values Jam today. Oh, thank you very much. And I can I concur with that. It, the, yes. It's the, the big picture, the small picture. Thank you so much. Bye, Alex. Bye-bye.